Thanks for joining me today on The Rocks. For this episode, we have two special guests, Leanne Kemp and Raclaine Condon, the CEO and head of product, respectively, for Everledger, where their team works to increase transparency and trust with technology, blockchain specifically, in close collaboration with industry partners. On today's episode, we start with one of my personal favorite topics, gemstones, and how important provenance is to the industry, and what lessons have been learned from the issue of blood diamonds that can be applied to batteries. Leanne and Raclaine also educate me on this episode about some blockchain terminology and protocols, and how those protocols impact the environmental footprint of blockchain operations. We hope you enjoy this week's episode, or a glass of something, whether it's rabbit hole bourbon like I'm drinking today, or coffee or tea like Leanne and Raclaine. Let's jump in. So welcome, Leanne and Raclean. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. How are you both doing? Swimmingly well, swimmingly well. I'm in Schiphol Airport in the midst of the Diamond District here near Amsterdam and, of course, Antwerp. Wonderful. And Raclean, you're, you're not in quite an exotic location, right? No, I'm in uh, Canada today and I'm also doing really well. Not that a Canada isn't exotic and thrilling, but yeah. <laughs> Well, it's great to have you both on. Um, I was really excited to talk to you both today because, uh, as my team knows, blockchain is something that I, I'm constantly trying to rack my mind around. I mean, working in the in the tech space within the mining industry, of course, there's there's a lot of focus on blockchain and how it's being applied. And there are just so many applications and different kind of explanations for why it's so important. It's, it's really exciting to chat with folks. In that, uh, I actually selected my my whiskey for today based on that. I'm, I'm going to be drinking rabbit hole bourbon um, as we go down the rabbit hole of blockchain and its application <laughs> for the mining industry. So I wanted to get a little punny. Are either of you having a drink today with me, Raclean? I think you said you were. I am. I'm having a cup of tea because it's morning where I am right now. But uh, if I wasn't, I'd be probably having a hard ginger beer Mm. for the afternoon. And I'm swigging back a caramel macchiato, so I'm on a sugar high right now. (laughs) No better combination than sugar and caffeine together when you're traveling. Totally love that. Well, I would love to start by talking about gemstones and what you all have done with gemstones. I know you've you've worked with diamonds as well as emeralds, and emeralds hold a special place in my heart uh, from my time in Afghanistan. My engagement ring is an Afghan emerald from Panjshir Valley. Um, and every time I go to new countries to work in mining, my favorite thing to do is to buy gemstones locally from local miners and use that when I travel and go to meetings to tell stories about the countries I work in and the people who work in the mining industry. So while I'm not a gemologist and I've never worked in actual gem mining, I think they have this power to kind of communicate about the industry, right? And there, there's something that everybody kind of understands. Even my six-year-old daughter loves polished rocks and gems and asks mommy questions all the time about about gemstones and how they're formed. So I'd love for you to kind of tell me a little bit about what you've been doing in the gemstone space. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we started Everledger in the heart of London in 2015 and visioned how we could build a platform of provenance to bring traceability to some of the most opaque and conflicted supply chains in the world. So we began with diamonds, tracking diamonds from the source of the mine right the way through to the retail network. There's probably many people who would remember Leonardo DiCaprio's movie, Blood Diamonds, that was really one of the impetus from my perspective to start the company. And moving forward from diamonds into coloured gemstones, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, even pearls out of Australia. And as you say, there's such a romantic and alluring story of the diamond and gemstone trade that just simply hasn't necessarily being told. And so how do we bring technologies to the forefront, put the tooling in the hand of industry to tell their truthful story? And seven years later, just shy of four million gemstones on the platform, we've given birth to that exact set of tooling that industry can tell that very good story. And there's so much to the industry, whether we remember it only from the blood diamond disaster, but there is incredible 
impact that industries make, whether it be in the creation of community. Uh, parts of our work in Tanzania in the early days of Everledger was to help 50 mining women enable direct access to trade so that they could realise profits, but also enable them to be educated more about the gemology, as you say, that gemological makeup that enables them to access fair trade for fair prices and then enable the profits from that trade to go back into increasing the requirements of community, whether that be education or otherwise. So do you see provenance really driving customer behavior then? Are you starting to see that reality? You know, one could say in 2015 it was a millennial thing where, you know, the younger (laughs) generation were asking questions about where does something come from. And often provenance is um, heavily tied with the French provincial and the backdrop of art. You know, provenance was definitely hand in hand in the art industry. But provenance is a most generic position term now is applied to all industries in the world, whether it's asking the question, where does my food come from? Where does metals and minerals, how are they mined and the impact that it's having? the the sort of cost of the planet. And really that's what we bear the entire efforts towards is how do we enable an industry to tell that truthful story and to enact in a far better, more legitimised way of trade. Mm -hmm. And it happens so that through the evolution of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, we were able to identify an incredibly powerful set of network protocols that happen to be coupled with database technologies, hence the birth of the blockchain, that could give us that connectivity layer from the physical world to the digital world. So I wonder, maybe, Raclean, you could walk us through how your blockchain product actually facilitates that. Like, what does it look like when you have gemstones up on the platform? What does that mean to someone who's not familiar with this space? Sure. So, I mean, in essence, you know, the blockchain is essentially an immutable ledger where you can record anything that you want to. And and as Leanne said, we specialize in, you know, trying to create that digital to physical connection between something in the real world and then, you know, creating a digital twin, I guess, of it uh, on the blockchain. So I think in in the gemstone industry and, in fact, all of the industries we operate in, there's obviously really complex supply chains that sit behind this. You know, it isn't that someone's mining that gemstone out of the ground and then suddenly it miraculously appears in your in your local shop or, or in your hands. There's a number of people who are um, and players that these materials pass through on their journey. And I guess the power of the blockchain is that as this journey for this gemstone, as it's mined and then passed through to traders, transacted in different markets, uh, maybe cart graded, you know, all of the processing that needs to occur before it's it's ready for someone to to put it onto to their engagement ring, as you have done. Um, I think you know the blockchain allows all of those different parties to be able to share the data that they need to about where it's coming from and where it's going to, and do that in a way that's you know immutable, recorded forever. I guess is what I mean by immutable, and therefore we can actually start to verify when somebody says, hey, this is where this particular gemstone came from. We have that that trail of proof that's stored and probably not just provenance, not just where it's come from, but also maybe as to the practices of the people in the communities where it was mined or, you know, the treatment of it through its chain depending on what that treatment needs to be. So we can look at other things around, you know, human rights, uh, um, the lack of child labour in those supply chains and being able to really provide the substantiation and evidence behind those claims that people, you know, want to make about where their their stones in the case of gemstones are coming from. Yeah, and it's a web-based technology. So ultimately it can connect not only to machines that might scan the gemstones, but also it interacts into the websites where websites are selling diamonds or gemstones and then also into applications that sit on you know mobile phone devices or smartphone devices so ultimately it's a protocol it's a network protocol that enables us to be able to connect physical and digital together and then send transaction information you know to and from each other across a connected network of known participants and we've deployed on what we call a private permission chain so therefore we do kyc checks on each of the companies and the people that are connected to the chain it's not like a public permissionless chain in so much that the likes of cryptocurrency can be purchased without a formalized KYC check or know your customer check. Whereas so we have quite stringent compliance rules on who can interact across our network. And by virtue of that, that provides also a level of trustfulness in understanding the who in industry is participating. And from a supplier perspective, you know, the folks that are actually mining the stones that go on the network, 
Are these typically big companies or does it include small companies, artisanal miners, or who kind of makes up the, the input side? Well, I mean, the diamond industry is quite a sophisticated, you know, well-established industrialized supply chain. So you see many very large, large companies dominate that industry. The opposite applies to color gemstones. There's actually only one or two quite large formalized industrial players in that space. And the rest are artisanal small-scale producers. I mean, we've reached out into countries like Tanzania. I was in the Congo DRC for two weeks, in South Africa, Botswana, Angola. So our customers legitimately are globally connected around the world. Um, the technology isn't biased as to whether you're enterprise or whether you're artisanal producers. And, of course, each geographical network provides for certain challenges of collecting data. As you can imagine, the connectivity in the midst of Kinshasa in the Congo DRC is a very challenging environment to be able to validate a gemstone. But there are ability for us to at least identify the geolocation of the mine, the extraction of that mine, and then there's more formalised points of that international trade where a diamond and or a gemstone will cross a border, where each of those are typically housed in quite sophisticated, large structural centre cities where there is a lot more affordable connectivity. And so our technology straddles all of those concerns and challenges in market, which is why we have everything from Tanzanite from Tanzania across to Pearls in far north in far north Western Australia, where there's very little connectivity to be able to capture this data. That's fascinating. I know when looking at the gemstone issues in Afghanistan, as an example, it was always a huge opportunity, I thought, to leverage technology to allow those who are trying to do things legitimately, including like, you know, have they paid taxes and royalties off of stones, right? Are they exporting legally in addition to the the conditions on the ground and, and how they were mining to be able to lay out conditions upon which folks in emerging markets can participate more fully in the more structured industry, right? And like you articulated, you know, get better prices for their product, right? Because they could demonstrate that they were doing it the right way. Because so often, you know, whole countries get painted with the same brush, right? And it's hard for, for producers, I think, to distinguish themselves from bad actors. I don't know if you've seen that play out in how this is applied. Sure. There's like best practice principles that are often standards that industry adhere to and follow. There are, of course, then NGOs that are incredibly important in localised markets. But I would say there are significant scientific material science endeavours that uh, are quite mature in today's market where we are able to, you know, see and understand the chemical makeup of a gemstone and know that it's from Burma or from Afghanistan just purely by either isotope or the material makeup of that physical gemstone. So there's both the connectivity of what I call forensic science to understand the forensic makeup of, you know, critical mineral or or a bale of wool from Australia, which we also do traceability for. And then, of course, there is the method of operations, the chain of custody and the handling and the fairness in that ESG, the environmental, social and governance requirements of doing, you know, doing good things while doing well. Um, and I think there's an overlay of, of that incredibly sh- complex structured data, but ultimately it enables them then to tell that truthful story, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Yeah, you must have seen some substantial resistance, I would imagine. Sometimes I've seen so much that I can't unsee it. So let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Gotcha. No, I I think it's really interesting, though, where technology, when it can be used to, as you say, it, you know, tell the true story, right? When it brings, as I always remind people, transparency is very different from accessibility. So you might have transparency of data, but if it's not accessible to the people who actually need access to it, it doesn't really change anything. But when you combine those two, that's where I think you start to see disruption and disruption always brings resistance, right? When when the sun starts to shine on things that maybe were a little shady in the past. But I think it's one of the things that technology really can do and help things change quicker. I would imagine that's something you've seen at least. Yeah, let's think about what's happening right now, and that is the OFAC sanctions that have been put against Russia. Very stringent and strict trading requirements. Now, Russia's 35% of the entire world population or global extraction for diamonds And USA is the largest market for diamond and jewellery purchases. And literally overnight, you know, the US retailers and OFAC 
um, have put down a pretty stringent compliance law of no selling of diamonds from the origin of Russia. If it was not for Everledger's platform, our ability through smart contracts, our widget technology, the retailers really were blind to the realities of where they're purchasing from. Even though they might have a trustful tier one supply relationship, which means their buyer and seller relationship is very strong and truthful and trustful, there's nothing that gives visibility to tier two, tier three, tier four supply chains. And that's really the difficult work that we're arm wrestling to the ground. And could you maybe explain for the listeners what those tiers mean? Tiers mean that I buy it from my immediate supplier, but there's a supply supplier and a supplier's supplier's supplier. (laughs) And it tiers all the way back to a mine or a farm or even a machine that might bake a diamond, which is what's happening in the lab growing space. So when I mean by tier one, tier two, tier three, in the gemstone space, there's sometimes a gemstone will cross through 16 different hands just to enable that diamond to be landed in a store in San Francisco. I think that's so interesting. And and for those who have been listening for a few months to On the Rocks, just a a reminder, we had Brad Brooks Rubin on uh, a few months ago who was at the Century and the Responsible Jewelry Council. And that was right before they had quite a big, significant internal issue around Russia's participation in the council, um, where where Brad actually ended up leaving um, partly over that issue. And he and I spoke quite a bit about how important sourcing is for a variety of minerals. But his involvement with Century was certainly focused on on gemstones as well as the council. So it's certainly... the foremost expert in the field. So that's brilliant. I mean, certainly the diamond and gemstone space is the most simplistic supply chain. It's a rock. We dig it up, we cut and polish it, done. The work that Racoline's team does in critical minerals is far more intriguing and much more complicated. And really, to be honest with you, it's a near impossible task that we've come together on to try and solve. So to me, I think diamonds was the perfect first use case and gemstones, of course, with it being a rock cut and polished into the hands of consumers. But ultimately, the real win is going to be in what is coming next with no blood diamonds. Is there a blood batteries on the horizon? Yeah, so explain that that concept. I mean, I would I would imagine, you know, when everyone's talking about lithium and, and nickel, I mean, there's all sorts of battery minerals or, and also critical minerals that folks are focused on right now that aren't actually traditionally mined to a great extent in more developed countries. And so a lot of that production that's going into the batteries is coming from markets where there are real concerns, right, about the the ESG implications of increased mining in those areas. Yeah, look, I think that the I think it's an interesting point, and I think that it's it's not just the impact of uh, increased mining in in particular jurisdictions where maybe there aren't you know as strong labour laws and controls or you know other regulations and um, and checks and balances, but also you know often these new critical minerals that are absolutely required for us to be able to electrify the world and decarbonize at the rate we need to to stop the climate uh, emergency and to you know to I guess try and mitigate the effects of the changes we've made on the environment so. Uh, um, whether they're in, uh, you know, countries with more, I guess, robust controls or not, they're still develop, you know, uh, impacting fragile ecosystems and the communities, you know, that they exist in. I think I. I could probably quote a number of statistics, but I was at PDAC in Toronto, uh, which is the world's largest uh, mining conference, a few weeks ago, and you know the focus was absolutely on critical minerals and and the race and the need for uh, the world to essentially start mining vaster quantities than we have before. Um, of course, there's a there's a piece there for the world as well around circularity and making sure that we're actually reusing, recycling, and repurposing um, those minerals once they're used once and they you know then move on to have a second life so that we're not just you know mining new materials out of the ground as well and that was part of the conversation but essentially a lot of that focus is whether it's in Canada whether it's in Australia or whether it's in you know African nations and other places these deposits of these minerals you know often are not being exploited at the moment and there's a need for the world to quickly stand up those operations as well and so you know I think there's a an increased recognition that we need to we need to have minds to satisfy what we need to do um, for humanity and to 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 decarbonize. Yeah. But on the opposite side, you know, minimize uh, the impact or, or do that in a in a really, I guess, a more responsible way. You know, that that satisfies the needs of of stakeholders right across the ecosystem, including those communities uh, where the mines are, are going to be established or already established. Do you see the same potential conflict generation around battery metals that 
of course, everyone associates with blood, blood diamonds. Is that a pressing concern? Absolutely. I think there's any time that there's a really big economic push or reason, you know, for people to tr- to try and do something at speed with haste uh, and where there's a profit involved, there's always, you know, the, the I guess, the likelihood or the possibility, you know, of, of negative things occurring, whether that's by bad actors or whether it's on purpose or not, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, um, I mean, I guess, you know, the critical minerals and metals aren't the same as diamonds. You can't slip them in your pocket and traffic them around the world in that way. But, you know, they absolutely are going to be in high demand. And, and you know, you've seen prices of those metals uh, fluctuate wildly, but in some instances, you know, go up by hundreds of percents over the last period of time. You saw nickel in particular. I think the LME had to, you know, suspend the spot price and trading of that earlier this year as the you know the market um, reacted to things that were going on um, and again in those situations that just creates pressure on on everybody in the supply chain and I think you know there's yeah opportunities for people to to exploit that in all sorts of different ways so yes it's not going to be quite the same problem as blood diamonds but you know different problems but uh, similar kind of challenges if that makes sense yeah so how how does blockchain affect that or what kind of difference can blockchain technology make in the path that those projects or those minerals may take and their potential impact? Yeah. So look, I think, you know, blockchains are technology as we've talked about. And as, as Leanne said, it's a, it's a network protocol that allows, you know, allows people to communicate in, in a way that's structured on a distributed ledger technology. And we can interact with all sorts of different platforms and systems to be able to do that. So it's not blockchain itself that will actually change the world. You know, it's the application of that technology in solving a business problem. And if that business problem is, as you've said, you know, creating more transparency across those supply chains into the practices that are occurring at each stage of those uh, supply chains, that's what will actually change it. So I think, you know, in specifically what blockchain brings is the ability for, for parties who aren't maybe, you know, necessarily the same party and maybe don't have that level of trust between each other to share the relevant information about their practices, to substantiate those for others to be able to, to check and verify those in order to, you know, build that connected story about something as it's mined from the ground and, you know, transformed on its way through you know, for example, as it goes into, you know, an electric vehicle battery for a car. Um, so in the example of uh, I'm going to pick, um, say, tin, mm-hmm. uh, it's not a not a critical mineral in every jurisdiction, but tin is used in everything. And I think we were talking to one of the auto OEM recently and, you know, tin is used in the windscreen of a car, for example. You know, it's an integral component and, and most people don't think of tin as a critical mineral, but it is used and, of course, tin is one of th- those uh, metals that's, yeah, conflict minerals. Um, and so I think, you know, just thinking about that, every piece of componentry that goes into a car typically uses either small or large amounts of these minerals and metals and practices around the world that relate to those are wide and varied. And so particularly consumers, but also auto OEMs and others that are particularly at that that downstream end of the supply chain are really interested in making sure that where they're sourcing their materials from conforms to the kind of standards that they want to see coming from their suppliers. So blockchain allows them to build that connected story uh, right the way through from mine through to, you know, the the parts and, and things that are going into the cars, for example, that they're manufacturing or, you know, that a consumer is ultimately buying. When we first started, we thought about that question, where does something come from? You know, provenance is a very key driver, but the same question could be, where does something go to after it leaves me? You know, the circular economy, the principles of first life, second life, third life of use. And when we think about the construct of natural mining, which is really what Rackeline's been talking about, the extractive industries where mining and they dig holes out of the ground, chip these, minerals and metals there's also the concept of urban mining and so when we think about the urban mining concept as we are mining a finite resource one of the most tragic events in my lifetime is to see that there is no more diamonds in Australia the Argyle mine is shut Uh, yet we were one of the proudest nations to export some of the best pink diamonds in the world for generations And so the reality of that is hitting home. There are some mines that exist in Australia where there's only 60 years left in the life of that mine. Now, 60 years might seem like more than a lifetime, but the reality is by the time I'm in a nursing home, we'll see some mines and some metals and minerals reach their end of life. So the concepts and the constructs of the technologies that we bring is not just looking at it from the perspective of the extractive industry and that natural mining, but it's also helping to give visibility to material banks, 
what materials exist in some of the items that might become visible as their end of life. A battery will die at some point after three years or five years. There is critical minerals that could be extracted from those objects. And so this key construct should actually be no longer talked about as the circular economy. We should actually get to the point of just saying that is the economy. That's the way it should be to design for disassembly. Yeah. And so do you, are you having those kinds of conversations with the OEMs where it's also denoting not just what goes into a battery, but how much of that could be extracted for disassembly? Because I know there are some complexities around that, right? And battery recycling just being one one aspect. So talk is cheap. We've actually got it in place already with our key customer, Ford, where they have the Mark E, which is the electric vehicle battery that resides in the car. And at the term of its end of life, the network of refurbishers, recyclers and disassemblers are able to extract those metals and minerals and report on the recycling content of the battery supply chain. Policy in the European Union is now beginning to be legislated around what we call the extended producer responsibility. So no longer is it just the responsibility of the battery manufacturer themselves, it also needs to become a responsibility of the OEM. And so policy is helping to accelerate this. OEMs are starting to walk the talk. And of course, we're building the technology, the digital rails to enable this network to be built and for it to be, you know, formed in terms of telling that truthful story again. No, that's fascinating. So you're, so is this a little bit different, it sounds like, than the, the gemstone, I would imagine the one of the key drivers is the actual consumer desire to know provenance and to know like my engagement ring was not mined by a child in awful mining conditions, right? And driving conflict somewhere. I mean, that I can kind of relate to personally, whereas the the battery supply chain issue does seem to be more of a corporate responsibility aspect where I wouldn't really think people buying a Ford, that that's one of their top five questions of buying a vehicle, but the company really cares about that because of policy and, and corporate responsibility. Is that is that accurate? Well, I mean, OFAC is a legislation, right? So OFAC is actually a driver of government uh, and that OFAC sanction is driving the reporting on the origin of a diamond that happens to be geographically situated today as Russia. But a number of years ago, those same OFAC sanctions were forced upon Zimbabwe as a prime example. So it is actually both a driver of the conscious consumer. So how do you bring the fullness of the information for the consumer that is consciously aware of these questions? And maybe they've asked the question inside of their mind, but there's never been an enablement of systems and data for them to get that truthful answer. And then most definitely there are governments and the alignment, whether it's the decarbonization urbanization strategy with greenhouse gas emission reporting, the burn down to net zero, or even, you know, as you say, the declaration of origin or ESG credentialing, the governments have awoken to this and they're enabling policy, which will accelerate industries towards change. I've certainly heard uh, one of the resistance talking points is that increased ESG or, or tracking measures, the cost of that either gets pushed down to the small miner or to the consumer, as opposed to being paid at the corporate level or or paid, for example, out of a government you know, initiative, right, out of taxpayer funds. And I wonder if you have a rebuttal for that or, or kind of an explainer of how that works, where costs of these types of technologies and tracking, like how does that affect the cost of the product or the amount of money that the people on the ground actually receive for their work? Well, the externality of cost is being paid by every single person, particularly when we think about waste or the ability to not track waste. And if we can reuse waste, then indeed it can be not seen as just a dead end output to something, but a renewed input to something else. So there's 20 grams of silver in every solar panel. And at the end of the life of a solar panel, you can deconstruct that. There's silica, of course, and sand and glass that can be recycled. But that silver could actually be an input of use into the diamond and jewellery industry. And who would have thought that the solar panel industry could work closely with the jewellery industry? So when you talk about it being an endemic cost to only two ends of the supply chain, it being either the minor or the small players versus the consumer, I'm not sure that that's actually the most truthful stance when ultimately you're not able to get the output of something if it's not measured. And a lot of these issues are just simply not measured. Mm -hmm. 
I guess I'd also like to add that I think, you know, any technology platform, you know, what we're talking about here is also digitization often of existing uh, processes that happen with paper-based uh, practices in the real world. So if we look at, you know, the work that we've done in the diamond and gemstone and other industries, uh, a lot of the time we're not adding a huge amount of additional onus onto, you know, the different players at different stages of that supply chain. We're working with existing documentations, as Leanne mentioned before, you know, some of those are, are well entrenched regulatory processes and documentation like the Kimberley processes and, you know, diamond uh, certifications and grading certificates and all those sorts of things that are happening anyway. So it's about making sure that they're, you know, that they're ingested into the blockchain platform in a way that's easy for people along that supply chain to participate in. And that's a, that's a key part of how we design the system that we build to make sure the participation is easy and seamless as possible for those people along the chain. And actually the companies themselves often derive a benefit out of that because if they had, you know, been previously relying on a paper-based system, digitizing it actually allows them to have a greater depth of reporting and understanding of what's happening in their own business in some cases and and how they interact with their suppliers in a more data-driven way as well. So absolutely there is a cost, but I think it's offset often. Um, you know, the big one, as Leanne called out, is, you know, there's, there's externalities that are happening in these markets anyway. But for the companies involved, there's often benefits as well. Yeah. And one other, um, you know, note that I oftentimes hear, and I think it's because of a misunderstanding of the difference between blockchain and Bitcoin or crypto mining is that the blockchain slash crypto world is environmentally harmful because of the amount of energy that's required in order to do all of this. And we've certainly looked at comparisons between, you know, the environmental impact of mining a Bitcoin versus mining a gold coin. Right. And, and and sometimes folks are really surprised because they don't understand how much power is required in order to do that. But I wonder if you want to maybe clarify the differences between, you know, Bitcoin or crypto mining and blockchain and and the environmental aspect of how that works. Ultimately, the energy generate. I think you're you're largely correct, actually, in the comparison between private permission chains versus public permissionless chains. So the energy draw and the energy usage, particularly in the Bitcoin network, is driven based on the consensus algorithms. So what that means is there are a series of computer mathematics, computer problems to be solved that requires multiple nodes on a network. And a node could be an IP-driven sort of computer sitting in the background that needs to run its CPU compute space over a period of time to be able to mathematically solve for a problem. And when you extrapolate the size of the Bitcoin network or even the Ethereum public permissionless network, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of computers that have 24-7 uptime constantly computing based on these, um, you know, sort of gamified algorithms to be able to then effectively mine what they call sort of mine a coin. In the private permissionless ledger, which is what we work on, our consensus methodology is what we call federated consensus. So it, as I said, um, provides for an environment where we can identify trustful known parties that connect to the blockchain. They have a node and or we can identify trusted machines. So for example, a scanning machine that might scan a physical diamond. Now it doesn't require the ability to solve for a really hard mathematical problem. It's purely based on the voting rights of the data segment that's being asked for it to confirm. Now some of that confirmation will happen just cross-verified by this company on this computer is a legitimate verified source of information. So it will effectively electronic stamp that that transaction is from that trustful source. So they're very different to different environments. And even in the public permissionless environment, you have proof of stake, proof of work. A number of those consensus methodologies are also changing because arguably the world does have an issue in public permissionless ledgers with energy source. So it's an undeniable fact that that problem has to be solved. We, however, chose to work strictly in a private permissionless environment. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I, I was I was unfamiliar with, with some of those terms, like uh, the federated consensus. I mean, that's that's an interesting, uh, I had not learned anything about that before this. So thanks for, for educating me on that. Um, so that's something that folks should really look for if it is a concern of theirs, is to look at the difference between the, 
remind me of how you articulated it, the consensus framework, is that right? Or the con- um, Yeah, it's called a consensus methodology. So there's okay. proof of work, proof of stake, which typically is deployed in a public permissionless environment. And mm-hmm. then when you have environments in private permissioned environments, which is what we work in, there is federated consensus or there is a consensus where it's purely based on the weight of the voter and some of those are equally weighted, as you would say in a domestic, you know, democratic voting system um, or it could be benevolent dictatorship, (laughs) which (laughs) the biggest arm wrestle wins. Uh, We certainly don't have that. And those in, in 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 this situation with the way you all work, then those trusted nodes are are decided upon by you. They're vetted by you. They're they're put together for this specific application. Is that correct? Well, not necessarily only decided by us, because ultimately you you recognise before the responsible jewellery council who plays a significant role in our industry to identify credential and effectively bring standard operating procedures to the industry. So it, people on our network in the diamonds gemstones industry are, are SIBJO authorised and or they're RJC authorised. Um, for example, in India, we have another authority called GJEPC, which is really a bounded government authority in India that can identify that that company is a legitimate diamond trader with a licence. And so we actually lean into the construct of licensed entities or endorsed entities by government. And same too, I mean, our work in Australia with you know, the Australian government and, and, the, and the work for critical minerals also provided for an environment where we could integrate with IRMA, which is International Responsible Minerals Council or association, where they were able to provide the authentication to us. Even though we could identify this company as a mining company, how do we know that they're actually of good standing? And so it's the triangulated network of those trusted providers that also are an important part of our network. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, I learn I learn something every day in this space. And with that, like, where do you both see this space going? And in particular, with the focus on the mining industry and the mineral space, like, is there something new that you're working on or that you think will be coming up in the next few years? Look, I think it's you know I think uh, I'd love to be a soothsayer and be able to predict the future entirely, but I think what we see and what we hear really from uh, all of the the people across right across this ecosystem that we talk to on a daily basis is that the pace of change continues to ramp up. There's no slowing down in that. It's just a I, I guess an ever speeding uh, up escalator or a wave of change that's coming, and that change specifically you know in the area that we work in is is that greater push for greater transparency around ESG practices right across the supply chains. So I think you know I, I without being specific as to exactly what that entails, we've touched on some of those themes today. We're seeing different jurisdictions increase the amount of regulatory control uh, that they're wanting specifically about visibility down and up supply chains. So rather than and, you know, just regulation at an individual mining level, as Leanne talked about before, things like increased producer responsibilities. Or, for example, in the case uh, of in Germany, you know, the supplier due diligence uh, legislation and things like carbon border adjustment mechanism taxes, which require you to really look right back up your supply chain and look at the carbon intensity of things that that you're importing into the, the country and then a, a essentially applies a carbon tax uh, across that. So I think what we're seeing, you know, generally is that is that push for more transparency from all sorts of sectors. And you mentioned some of them before. So some of it's regulatory, some of it's consumer demand, some of it's, you know, uh, individual companies' strategies in terms of their own uh, corporate social responsibility and their own positioning in society that they want to take. Yeah. And look, for me, carbon is the new calories. I mean, when we think about what happened a number of years ago and I pick up, a, you know, a tub of yogurt in a shopping centre, I was really keen to understand the ingredients and the amount of, you know, calories that I'm going to have when I consume that product. So carbon is the new calories. It's going to be carbon labelling on everything from running shoes to diamonds right the way through to electric vehicle batteries. Yeah, and I I mean, I keep waiting to see that happen from a supply chain perspective, in particular in like solar panel manufacturing, wind turbine manufacturing, and the, you know, that aspect, because uh, Suzanne Green, a, a friend and a colleague who used to be at MIT's Transportation and Logistics Center, did this phenomenal work around 
how do you calculate the carbon footprint of the transportation space, right? And she was the one that really explained to me that when you look at mineral commodities, the greatest carbon that's expended is actually in moving the ore, right? From the mine to a port, and then in particular, from a port to another port, right? Because of how dirty the shipping industry is from a carbon perspective. So I keep waiting to hear that, right? Like, especially I would imagine with something like Everledger, if you can connect you know, this ton of ore was moved on this ship, which expends X amount of carbon for every ton of of transport, you could really start to understand even at the at the bigger level and things like steel and iron and, and, you know, things that are kind of mass commodities as they're moving around the world, where is the carbon footprint coming? Because I think it's something that a lot of folks don't understand that they think mining is dirty, like at the source, right? And there's certainly a lot of impact there, But it's also because of how interconnected our world is and how much minerals move around the world to be processed in different locations to varying degrees before they're put into an end product, right? I mean, like a ton of of iron, like goes through so many steps before it ends up in a turbine blade. Well, why don't you invite us back in October because we'll have something to talk about from solar panels to turbines. (laughs) Awesome. All right. Well, we'll put that on the calendar. I, I, I seriously, I'm like, I can't believe, I mean, so it'll be really exciting if, if you all are working on that, because I'm like, it seems like such a logical place to, to start tracking that. So yeah, excited to, excited to chat more in October. Well, and as we're wrapping up, I've been uh, asking all of our guests at the end of the show, if you could wave your magic wand and change one thing about the mining industry overnight, what would you change? My Starbucks coffee had way too much sugar in it. That's the first thing that I would change, no doubt. But um, I think for me, the biggest one, I, I wrote about this more recently, and that is the tragedy that is carbon offsets. And I fundamentally think that it's a broken system that we should be looking at insecting. So for anyone listening, there's a Forbes article that I wrote uh, about a month ago now. And I think the investment money is heading in the wrong direction. Um, we're really just grabbing you know, a sugary drink instead of sort of hydrating with the right, you know, level of investment, solving the really, really hard problems. So I think investors' monies are going in the wrong area. They're funding sort of rating indexes or companies that are providing for surveys based on opinion of industry, or they're funding things like carbon offsets, when ultimately the real race for decarbonisation is at an infrastructure and systems level. And I don't know that that's really getting the attention that it needs to. Um, not that Everledge is trying poor. In fact, we're doing quite well for ourselves, but ultimately it's frustrating to see that some of these projects, you know, are able to swag $70, $80 million on the front face of something that really doesn't have the integrity and the deep-rooted system to solve for the challenge. So um, I think I could solve the problem of not enough sugar or too much sugar in my Starbucks coffee, but I'm not sure that I can solve the problem of investors taking the sugary drink like the Gatorade over the hard problem solving hard issues. Well, that's why we, we use the magic wand for those problems. That's why, because they're, they're usually really. <laughs> I'd like a magic wand too for many problems. Um, I guess my, my view on that question is I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not a miner by background. My background's in product management and technology. So I guess I answer it from a slightly different slant. I think that the opportunity for the world generally is, uh, you know, particularly as we look at decarbonisation and electrification of the world, is around, you know, trying to start to incorporate an understanding in the way that we play around the externalities across many industries. So whether it's the extractive mining industries or the downstream processing industries, in the goods that we as consumers use, the more that we can do to incorporate those externalities as they currently sit into the economics of how we make decisions as government governments, as individuals, uh, as corporations. I think, you know, that serves everybody in humanity uh, in a better way. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing both of those perspectives. Well, I really enjoyed uh, having having you both on. And uh, even though I was the only one drinking anything uh, on the rocks, technically, during this show, but really look forward to having you back this fall and, and hearing what else new you have coming up. So thanks so much for spending some time with me today. And, and I know our listeners will, will really enjoy it and learn a lot. See you in October. We'll bring the solar panels. You bring the mic. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Emily. Thanks.